Great. Okay. As we have a, for, a quorum for the meeting, uh, the meeting will now commence in public session. Uh, apologies have been received from Senator Frank Fian and, and Ned O'Sullivan. Um, integrated Education. Today we are delighted to be hearing from the Integrated Education Fund and the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education on their work. Uh, this work has earned them a Nobel Peace Prize nomination for 2018, so I'm sure members will be very keen to hear about the positive contributions they are, they are making. Before we, in, uh, we begin, can I remind members, witnesses and, and persons in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phone, again because it, it interferes with, with the, uh, the sound system and unfortunately, even if it's on silent, uh, I think airplane, air, airplane uh, mode I think works. Uh, members are requested to ensure that for the duration of the meeting, the mobile phones are turned off completely or switched to airplane mode or safe or flight mode, depending on the device. It's not sufficient for members to just put their phones on silent modes as they will <coughs> maintain the level of interference with the broadcasting system, as we all know. So, I also remind members of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on criticise or make charges against a person or body outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. By virtue of section, uh, section 17, subsection 2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the Joint Committee. If they are directed by the, the chairperson to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to, to do so, they are entitled uh, thereafter only to qualified uh, privilege in respect of their evidence. Uh, they, they are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and they are asked to respect the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person or body outside the House or on official either by name or in such a way as to make him or it identical. So I would like to welcome the following to our meeting here today. Oshin Marshall, uh, Chief Executive of Northern Ireland uh, Council for Integrated Education. Amanda McNamee, uh, Principal, Lagan College. Hilary Copeland, uh, Chair of Trustees Integrated Education Fund. And Sam Fitzsimons, Head of Communications Integrated Education. You're all very welcome here today. The format of the meeting is that we'll hear your opening statements before going into a question and answer uh, session with the members of the committee. So I invite you to make your submission. So who's starting us off? Okay. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank the Joint Committee for the invitation to brief them on integrated education, and we welcome this opportunity. Members will be aware that the Integrated Education Fund and the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education have been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for 2019. We appreciate you seeing us in this context and for the support the TDs and Senators have given us over a long number of years, support we hope that will continue. The Nobel Prize nomination is, of course, not for two organisations as much for, as for those courageous, resilient and visionary parents, pupils, staff and governors of integrated schools, and in particular, the first 28 pupils who attended Lagan College. The current principal of that school is with us this afternoon. In the statement you make after this meeting, we would be very appreciative if you were to acknowledge the Nobel Peace Prize nomination and the recognition this bestows on all our pioneering families, staff and governors. I am going to hand over to Roisin Marshall uh, to continue with the opening statement. <laughs> Create the mood music. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm going to give you a brief overview of integrated education and the development of such over uh, the last 38 years. It was founded in 1981 by a group of parents in response to the challenge of community conflict and a religiously divided school system in Northern Ireland. Lagan, Lagan College was the first integrated school in Northern Ireland. Beginning with just 28 pupils, as Sam said, Lagan College is the most oversubscribed school now in Northern Ireland. By 1987, there were seven newly established integrated schools and the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education was formed as a charitable organisation to coordinate some of these efforts to develop integrated education and to support uh, parent groups through the process of opening new schools. 
and the 1989 Education Reform Order enabled NICE to support existing schools to grow and to um, promote integrated education. In 1992, the Integrated Education Fund was established as a charity to provide a financial foundation for the development and growth of integrated education in Northern Ireland. And its mandate is derived from the express demand of parents and in individual schools who seek integrated education for their children. In 2014, there was a landmark High Court judgment which compelled the Department of Education in Northern Ireland to fulfil their legal duty under Article 64 of the 1989 Education Reform Order and the commitment in the Good Friday Agreement to facilitate and encourage integrated education. And not only did that judgment rule that the department needs to be alive to the Article 64 at all levels, including the strategic level, but it also outlined what an integrated school is striving for, to achieve an equal balance in relation to worship, celebration, and exposure to both faiths reflected in its constitution. And the school's board must strive in its ethos to achieve this. For these reasons, an integrated school seeks to achieve religious balance amongst its pupils and its board of governors. Since then, the Department of Education has recognised their legal duty and agreed to over 25 school development proposals for growth in integrated schools, providing over 1,500 additional places in integrated schools in the last few years. This growth has been further enhanced by the Stormont House or the Fresh Start Agreement uh, and the capital commitment to, of 300 million to 23 existing integrated schools, of which three capital projects have been completed, and one further project is underway with the rest due to be completed by 2025. In terms of community and, and parental empowerment, no integrated school has ever been planned by government. Yet despite this, there are now over 24,000 pupils attending 65 integrated schools and demand for integrated school places continues to grow. The funding crisis in the overall education system means that the focus for growing the number of integrated schools and school places is to support existing schools to transform from non-integrated status to integrated status, rather than to build more new schools. To support and fulfil the wishes of parents for integrated education, the IEF has raised monies from a range of funders, including individual donors and trusts, to help empower parents seeking to transform their children's schools. This parental engagement campaign was launched in 2017. The IEF and NICE wish to acknowledge and thank the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs for their support for this initiative and their ongoing commitment over the past 15 years to both NICE and the IEF through their Reconciliation Fund in supporting integrated education. The parental engagement campaign uses a range of tools, including a dedicated website, www.integratemyschool.com, to encourage parents to register their support for their school to transform to integrated status. This bottom-up approach is also supported through outreach and direct engagement with parents, communities and schools. <coughs> the success of this campaign is highlighted in a survey by the polling company Lucid Talk, which shows that awareness of the process of transformation rose from 8% in 2012 to over 40% in 2018. NICE continues to provide practical support to encourage schools to take this step and then works with them through the process, which can take up to two or three years. In the past 40 years, we've had 20 such schools transform. And since the launch of the parental engagement campaign, in 2017, we've had six more schools taking the first steps on the journey towards integrated status by holding successful parental ballots on transformation. And I'm now going to hand back to Sam. Uh, Northern Ireland remains a divided society, and this is most notable in the largely, largely separate nature of our education provision, which means that the majority of our children and young people of school age continue to be educated within a single identity setting. Around 90% of pupils in Northern Ireland are educated in schools 
that identify with a single tradition or denomination. Only 7.2% of pupils in controlled schools are Catholic and 1.1% of pupils in Catholic maintained schools are Protestant. The collapse of the Assembly has presented challenges in growing integrated education, but it has also provided an opportunity for the integrated education movement to engage with politicians, educational stakeholders and academics to look at a way forward to seek an agreement for an independent commission to review education. The IEF's alternative manifesto sets out a roadmap for a more inclusive and integrated education system. And our collaboration with academics in Ulster University School of Education provides robust evidence-based research, which is helping cast a light on some of the areas of education <coughs> that contribute to both school separation and additional costs. An example of their work can be seen in the employment mobility of teachers and the federal exception briefing paper that we supplied. I'm going to hand over to Amanda McMee to give a little bit of background of integration in practice. Thank you for having me, everybody. My name is Amanda McNamee, and I have the very proud role of being principal of Lagan College in South Belfast, um, and I'm having a lovely day out in Dublin today. Um, Lagan College is Northern Ireland's first integrated post-primary school, as you've heard from Roisin. Uh, Lagan was founded in 1981, set against the troubles in the north of Northern Ireland. We started off very small with 28 students, 14 children would have been of Catholic faith and 14 of Protestant faith. And the school was originally housed in South Belfast beside the River Lagan, hence its name. Over the years, Lagan College has flourished. We now have 1,386 young people from the ages of 11 to 18 years uh, coming to our school. And we have 191 staff members working in the school. We are an integrated, inclusive and united community. Uh, on the beautiful National Trust site. The school was established by parents with a mission statement to educate to the highest standards children of Catholic, Protestant and other faith traditions and none, and of all abilities together. The four central values that underpin our school at Lagan are respect, reconciliation, service and equality. In Lagan, the children are educated together every day. Self-respect and respect for others are strongly encouraged. The integrated ethos is taught and shared to ensure the inclusion of children from different religions, different cultures, different genders, different abilities, different socioeconomic background, different sexualities, preschool meals, special needs, newcomer status, looked after children. Anybody is welcome in our school. Lagan College served to celebrate all the things that we have in common, but also to encourage the children to understand that we must appreciate the things that make us different and unique as individuals. Our school chaplains state that if something is important to one of us, it should be important to all of us. Therefore, everything we do, we do as one school community. We hold prayer if that's the child's choice to hold <coughs> prayer together, or we take time to reflect on things that are happening locally and in the world. We have assemblies such as Remembrance Assembly and Ash Wednesday Assembly together, and encourage our children to discuss the controversial issues rather than shy away from them. Over 38 years, Lagan College has built up a reputation for integrated practice, academic excellence, and pastoral child-centered care. Lagan College is an all-ability school, and we're a family school. We can take all the children <coughs> from the same family. We offer 32 GCSEs and 25 A-level post-16 courses. Aspects of the curriculum, such as RE, politics and history, are viewed by children through a shared lens. The learning that we offer is, is fun, innovative and challenging so that every child can reach their true potential. We enjoy sport. And I've been told by the children to mention our sport. We enjoy sport for enjoyment, to build team spirit and to win. And we've been all Ireland basketball champions. Last year we won the O'Reilly Cup for Gaelic football, which was the boys were really proud of. And we also have a strong reputation in other sporting aspects such as football, hockey, netball and rugby. As stated, Lagan has been in a very <coughs> strong position. We've been very much supported by our local community. We have been the most oversubscribed school for the past decade with this year 554 applications for 220 places alone. I believe as principal of Lagan College in South Belfast that there is a greater demand that we as a, than we as a school can meet. 
and I call passionately upon all those in government to support integrated schools as being the norm for families to be able to choose if they wish to. We believe that we are educating children not only for their own futures and their career pathways, but also to be the peace leaders of all our future. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for inviting us to be here today. I am here to speak to you uh, from the perspective of a past people of integrated education. I started to get involved in setting up, uh, as along with many other alumni, the integrated alumni in 2013. Uh, a number of former pupils of integrated schools who now live and work in various locations throughout the UK and Ireland and now the US also, uh, came together to offer us a social network group, uh, a way to connect and also to help support and encourage present pupils at integrated colleges uh, through mentoring, through career advice um, and through helping to raise their aspirations as well as to spread the message about integrated education and to lobby and campaign. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about when I first went to an integrated school. The school I attended is called Newbridge Integrated College. It is situated about 40 minutes south of Belfast and 40 minutes north of the border. When I started Newbridge at age 11, the school was in the third year of its existence. There had been a long de delay in the development of the school site in 1995 uh, in the rural small village of Loch Brickland in County Down. When the site had finally been secured, the delay was because the farmer who owned the field would only permit building work to commence once his harvest had been taken in. By the time I started in 1997, there were 156 pupils making up the entire student body which could quite easily have fitted into one of the rooms in this building today. During my time at Newbridge, there were no illustrious past pupils to come back and speak at assemblies and prize days because nobody had left yet. When I was 11 and I started secondary school in 1997, none of the, the issues that were happening around me in the mouth of the Good Friday Agreement just to be signed uh, the following year, none of those were factors for me. I wasn't aware of what was going on. I wasn't aware of what the adults were deciding around me about my future. I knew that my parents had let me do what I want, wanted. I, um, I wanted to go to Newbridge, although I was academically able and I had secured a place at a grammar school. They were happy for me to go to a school that did not have any academic attainment record that it didn't have any past pupils, it didn't have an established reputation. And when I look back at that now as an adult, I think about how brave we all were to take this huge leap of faith on an unfinished school that weeks before had been a feat, at a time when our country seemed to have little faith in the notions of peace and cooperation. 20 years later, I'm very proud that we all did have faith in this experiment. And I think particularly of the staff who left permanent positions at other schools to come to take part and to build, to establish a new place for us all. And how hard we all worked, because we wanted to make it work. We were very much united in a belief that this model of education, despite maybe externally having humble beginnings, and despite we, us knowing that we were in the minority, we were confident that this would build a better future for us all. It was when I started working as an adult, um, I lived in Scotland for a while, and then I moved back to work in arts management in Belfast. Um, and it was particularly clear to me then when I worked with other people who had gone to school in Northern Ireland, that their experience of school had been very different from mine. Um, and that's when I started to realize what that had meant to me. I learned that learning, working, making friends with all kinds of people who could talk about our differences and joke about the same things that we saw the rest of our country fight about was a normal part of our education. And that was just school to us. I came, became very aware that for most children in Northern Ireland, their experience of school <laughs> is not at all the same. <coughs> and that is something that we at the Integrated Alumni felt that perhaps we could change. Thank you. I'd like to hand back to Sam. Can I just finish by concluding? Um, 
We share the vision held by the overwhelming majority of citizens of a united community and a shared future. We are confident that a more integrated education system should be at the heart of the reconciliation process as reflected in the Good Friday Agreement. An essential, and I'll quote from the Good Friday Agreement, an essential aspect of the reconciliation process is the promotion of a culture of tolerance at every level of society, including initiatives to facilitate and encourage integrated education and mixed housing. I'd just like to thank the committee again for giving us the opportunity to come down and give a little bit of background on integrated education. Thank you. Okay, thanks, for, thanks very much for your opening statements. And a number of people want to come in. Now we take them in t maybe t groups of two, if that's okay. You know, two, two members asking questions, is that all? So, Francis, do you want to come first? Very much. And um, firstly, let me start by saying apologies. I have to leave a little bit early today. I just have another commitment that I have to attend. But I really wanted to be here today, and I wish I could stay for the whole for the whole afternoon, because this is something that I'm, you know, really interested in. Um, and I'm ashamed to say that it's only recently I met. I was at a, a social event um, up north. Uh, about a month ago and I met with a teacher from an integrated school and I'm ashamed to say that I wasn't aware there was even integrated schools um, up there. So, so when I saw this today, I was thinking, well, we need to find out more about this and I, I need to find out more about this. Um, and I also want to congratulate you on your Nobel Peace Prize. It's a fantastic, a fantastic achievement. Um, I suppose... <laughs> nomination, sorry. <laughs> Well, I always like to, you know, think ahead. So, yeah, you're going to win. You're going to win, and you de and you deserve to win it. There's no doubt about that. You're, you deserve to win it. Um, yeah, I suppose I'm I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by how it all works, you know, and to think that there's so many students um, in in your school um, uh, from cross community. I mean, that's really powerful. Um, I have no doubt there are probably some issues that must arise. Um, for, for you with regard to, you know, I mean, are there times when there could be two different groups from two different communities that might, I, I, I'm just wondering how that's managed or do you find, I'm, and this is only just me and maybe it's just my ignorance, so forgive me, but do you find that even from the sporting side of things, if you have a group who, you know, do the GAA and then a group who do, you know, rugby or football, that there's any you know, separation in that, and if so, how is that managed? Do you know? I mean, that's the first question I, I, I have. Declan, do you want to comment? You, again, Declan is to speak in the chamber, so just, uh, just uh, let him in early. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to thank Sam Roshan from Andon Hillary for her excellent presentation. Um, my background is a primary school teacher for 35 years before I came in here, and a um, small primary school where obviously we embraced an integration, obviously, of boys and girls, firstly, and obviously disability, secondly. And uh, the benefits that I could see from that uh, in terms of the influence on all children and indeed adults, uh, particularly in the disability sector, spoke for itself. Um, I like, Francis, I'd like to wish you well in your nomination. Uh, I have to say, as somebody who doesn't live too far from Loch Brickland, I didn't even know of the existence of the school. Uh, I wish you every success there, including Lagan also. Uh, a couple of um, just uh, quick ones. Uh, obviously, both, both presentations in the schools related to secondary, the, the level of uh, that type of integration at primary level, is it in existence uh, to any degree in the north, um, as opposed to the secondary uh, integration? But uh, I would come from a philosophy for everybody should have respect for everybody's view of the world. Um, and like Francis, you mentioned, you know, uh, the issue of uh, you know different maybe sporting activities, and we even have it currently in relation to whether it should be the uh, what with national anthem or otherwise uh, in uh, the rugby matches and so <coughs> such like. I'm particularly interested in the aspect, say, of is there integration of language because, um, uh, for example, it would strike me. Some, from my, some of my visits north, uh, particularly related to this committee, where we've been to all Irish schools, which I support as a Gael go myself, but how do you manage, or is there an issue of teaching all languages uh, and the issue of obviously sport and, and, and uh, that people get a, a, 
the opportunity to engage and learn about other people's uh, customs and, 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 and dare I say it, religions. Uh, it doesn't necessarily be religious, but from the, whether it's the rugby field or, 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 or soccer or Gaelic. Um, and, you know, obviously, my last comment would be that obviously I take it that the opposite of integration is segregation, and we've had too much of that in the past. <laughs> and I firmly believe that it's not just an issue in, in, in the north of Ireland, but it's an issue that needs to be addressed across the nation uh, so that people uh, have that respect and view of the other world. And I'm really, really delighted that you've made this presentation here today and wish you well in terms of uh, future accolades. Thank you. Thank you, Brett, uh, Declan. Uh, so, who wants to come back? And uh, thank you for both your questions, um, Francis um, and, and Declan, if I call you by your first name, that's okay. Um, we have over 44 feeder primary schools of the children coming into Lagan. Not all of those young people have attended an integrated primary school, so therefore um, when the children come in we have to make it very clear what the ethos and the values of the school are. And many of those children have held many of those values through their family. Uh, being raised by their families <coughs> coming to school. But we can't take for granted that children know how to learn about each other and how to respect one another, so that has to be helped and supported. Um, we take from the Latin at St Unum that we are one school community, and we tend to use the likes of sport uh, as a great analogy for people coming into one team, working together. So a lot of that is, is built by us as teachers and shaped by us as teachers and non-teachers to help the children to understand who they are, there's often a misconception that integrated schools are sterile communities, uh, that children's culture and faith background and uh, uh, family politics and passport that you hold, etc., is cleansed out. It's actually quite the contrary. We're very proud of children saying, you know, what passport they hold, whether they support Gaelic, whether it's rugby, whether it's soccer. We want to generate really healthy discussions by our children, not to be shy of that. Um, we haven't had a problem in Lagan encouraging children of different backgrounds to engage in sport. Um, we have you know, some of our best rugby players playing Richmond rugby are our, our Gaelic young men and women and vice versa. Um, the children enjoy uh, learning about something that maybe they haven't had a chance to learn about from, from their earlier years. Um, so, so to answer that question, um, it's, we, we support the children to have access to things that maybe they haven't had a chance to do at primary school. Where language is concerned, uh, my school uh, works through the medium of English, but every young person that comes to Lagan gets the opportunity to have enrichment Irish in their first year at Lagan. Uh, we tend to look at the lovely aspect of poetry, prose, song, uh, cultural place names, just to give the children an understanding of where uh, the school is situated in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, the north of Ireland, whatever way the children want to see themselves, but where their home is situated. Um, beyond their first year at Lagan, children may choose to do uh, Spanish, French, uh, Irish, right the way through to A-level, or indeed the likes of uh, Mandarin, which has been new for us. Yeah. Can I just ask one more question with regard to... Um, you know, what are the, what do you find are the problems that would arise for you with regard to the integration? Um, you, do you know what I mean? Like, are, are there any major problems that you might have that, you know, you have learned, you know, from when you opened to now and how did you overcome them? Does that make sense? Uh, we put a lot of energy into encouraging children to understand how they can respectfully speak about their differences. Mm -hmm. A lot of adults in our world struggle with that, um, and therefore we try to teach ways of listening to somebody else's point of view, to giving your point of view back again, but to not falling out because you have a difference, and certainly not to taking up arms mm -hmm. or to hurting somebody because you have a difference. So a lot of that is about teaching the skills mm -hmm. of how to um, be proud of who you are, um, but not to fear somebody else having a different opinion than you. Okay. So I, as principal, lead by example. I often tell the children about my own family, which is an integrated family, my own family story. And that often, you know, as staff working in the school, we see it as a vocation. We feel that we've been drawn to working in an integrated school because 
we strongly believe that there is a, 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 a sort of passionate peace element of working in integrated education in Belfast at the minute. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Brendan and then uh, Mickey Bray. And thank you very much, Cahir Egan. Like you and the other speakers, I, I welcome our, our delegation, our visitors today, and thank them for the for the comprehensive outline of the achievements to date, and obviously the need for for more um, progress as well. It, it's welcome that in the Good Friday Agreement, the, the it, it referred to facilitate and encourage integrated education, and um, of course, all of us would like would like if there was more progress made. I think with regard to the 65 schools, you're educating about 8% of the student population. That's still quite low by any yardstick. I had the, the privilege of visiting Nagan College in the mid-1990s. The British Irish Parliamentary <laughs> Group at that time comprising members of the Dáil and Shannon of the House of Commons and, and the House of Lords. There was a British Irish Parliamentary Group at that time when we visited the college. Um, we were doing some some studies in regard to education and where progress could be made, but it was, it was a much smaller school at that time. And when you see the 1386 student population today, it's a great achievement, so it is. Naturally, I would like to see more um, integrated schools. And um, could I ask you, are, when we talk about the, the 65 schools, are they all second level schools, or are there, there are some primary, primary and second level? So that was the question that uh, you had asked as well, Declan. Um, there are 45 primary schools and 20 post-primary schools. Right, thank you. One other thing I'd like to refer to is um, none of these were new schools as such. It, uh, presumably, we've had a growth of population in many areas that they take the developing areas of Dublin and the commuter belt and that, where we've had new um, new schools for, for, for new areas as such. In, in different areas that have developed in, in throughout Northern Ireland, has there been any integrated schools established that weren't transformed from a previous existence? <coughs> um, we have the opportunity here at second level, there's a, a plebiscite held among parents in regard to the type of second level schools they wish, whether it be community, whether it be a, a an education and training board school or a voluntary secondary school as well. You might just let me know what position, if the if new second level school is deemed necessary in, in X area, who has the opportunity to contribute to, to the decision making in regard whether it, what type of second level school it will be. Could you also give me an outline? Oftentimes, and I gather it from meeting different groups in Northern Ireland myself, is that it was often in the higher socio-economic areas, the areas where, where it's a terrible <coughs> phrase, but more, the more affluent areas at time had a, a, a bigger presence of integrated education than the areas where people were on lower incomes. Now that was suggested to me, and I'd just like to have your views. Is there a good spread in regard to the measurement, the socio-economic measurement? And I know that's not. The, the, the measurement we would all like, but it, it's, it's there. Um, and one other thing, when you don't have a minister in Stormont driving a programme, is that a few years lost where momentum could, could have been um, given to the area of driving integrated education? We all know that the, bu <coughs> the budgets are under particular control. And do civil servants, as, it, as, it, as the departments are administered by at the present time, are they in a position to make decisions in regard to if a school applies to, to change a status to, to uh, an integrated school? Do they have, to, do they have the <coughs> authority in the present administrative <coughs> arrangements to make such decisions? And I know that there, was, there were very worthy proposals for a major campus in OMA, and how, uh, presumably, there were in that particular campus there were plans for integrated schools at primary and second level and my understanding is that that project hasn't proceeded at anything like the pace we would like to see it so you might come back to me on those questions when you have an opportunity okay, thank you I, might take, I won't take Mickey again because there's quite a lot of questions there so maybe if you try and address some of these I think perhaps maybe we'll maybe divide up some of those questions um, 
in, in terms of measuring uh, socioeconomic um, enrollments within integrated schools? Profile, I suppose. The profile. Yeah. Um, the, these are figures from the Department of Education. Uh, it's, it's a crude measurement, but it's the only Same measurement thing. that we have, and that would be free school meals, uh, free school meal entitlement. And in primary schools, in integrated schools, it's sitting around about 27.7%. And in non-integrated schools, it's 29%. In post-primary, uh, this is non-grammar. Uh, th this is non-selective schools. Uh, integrated schools are 38% on free school meals. And in non-integrated schools, it's 39%. So that, that perception that integrated schools are very much for the middle class um, isn't reflected in uh, <coughs> the, the free school needs. And like many non-selective schools in the north, uh, we have integrated schools where free school needs are as high as 75% um, within some areas. So the, the, that perception, um, I think, is, is incorrect. Is, in, is incorrect, sorry. Um, the other question you asked in relation to Struel, uh, the campus in Oma, it's a shared education campus. That is not an integrated campus. Um, that is where uh, you will have five uh, schools of different management types, uh, Catholic maintained and controlled, relocating onto the one site. Uh, that, that, you're absolutely right hasn't progressed. Um, they have run into a number of issues in relation to that in terms of procurement um, and also uh, getting agreement from uh, the schools of how that will look like when, when it actually happens. Uh, Can I just add to that, Sam, that it's a very good point. Um, but there is an integrated campus just uh, in the same part of the world in Oma, and that's uh, Drumra Integrated College and OMA Integrated Primary School, um, so which uh, gives parents a choice for their children from three right through to 19. Okay. Anyone else saying about the, uh, with, uh, the assembly not sitting, you know, the difficulty? At least. So uh, just uh, very important to say that uh, in the last uh, number of years, I think it's three years now since the, the um, assembly came down, the civil servants, uh, so the permanent secretary uh, there, Derek Baker, has um, approved 25 of our development proposals for growth. So in a sense, that has not uh, hampered our growth until very recently, where we had four, five of our nursery units not approved. And the reason was that there wasn't enough money in the budget. Um, and we are very perturbed by that, looking into the future, thinking that uh, unless something is done in terms of the Assembly getting up and running again and um, our, our budget, our, our, our education system in general uh, receives more money into the system because we firmly believe that there isn't enough money in the system um, for it to run effectively. Um, and that could, in a sense, hamper our growth in the future. But up to this point, we feel that until very recently, those uh, turndowns, that actually we have managed to grow despite the assembly not being up and running. Uh, and can I just add, 8% does appear to be a low figure, but as mentioned here, no integrated school to date, no brand new integrated school to date has been opened by the government. They've all either been opened by parental power or they have been transforming schools. So we look forward to maybe the future where that will be a change. And important to say, sorry Sam, just that uh, 40 of the, of the 65 schools uh, that you mentioned, Breton, are, were started from scratch, as Amanda said. And that in itself, I think, if you look at the 65 schools over the 38 years, it roughly equates to two schools a year. Now, I don't know any other organisations that are able to say we developed 
two schools per year, apart from maybe Educate Together, of course. Um, so actually, the growth has been phenomenal. And when you think about groups of parents coming together to start those with, uh, with, with no money, <laughs> it is quite amazing. But 40 of them started from, uh, from scratch. So most of the 65 schools were brand new schools created. Uh, just to add to that, um, you asked about if they're looking at a new, a new school in a particular area. There are two planning authorities. Uh, that would be uh, the <coughs> CCMS, uh, who look after the maintained schools, uh, Catholic maintained schools, and there is the Education Authority that looks after controlled schools. Um, they plan for those sectors. And as mentioned previously, there is no body planning for uh, integrated schools. And on top of that, uh, we have an estimated 50,000 empty school desks. Uh, so there is rationalisation going on within uh, our education sector. And it is being rationalised on a sectoral basis. Um, whereas there is an opportunity for the planning authorities to look at retaining education provision in a particular area, uh, where you may have a Catholic maintained school and a controlled school that are undersubscribed, uh, both planning authorities will make decisions on whether or not to close down each of their schools. Uh, there isn't really a process in place where you could look at how the two schools could come together and make a sustainable school. Uh, the IEF are certainly working with uh, Ulster University in developing a community consultation mechanism. Uh, we have been working with the Education Authority and uh, CCMS to see if they could include that within area planning. We believe that we're making some progress in that, uh, and that would allow communities to decide what type of education provision they would like in their area. Uh, we would feel that when, from certainly uh, polling attitudinal surveys, uh, that the majority of parents would choose to have an integrated provision in their, in their community rather than no school at all. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks very much for the presentation and congratulations on your nomination and best wishes for that. I represent Newry RMR constituency, so I'm very aware of Newry, Bambridge, Newbridge. Um, from its inception, I'm well aware of the work it does, and um, I think it does a great job. And I think initially there was um, the sort of feeling locally that uh, the parents who uh, sent their children to integrated schools were kind of middle class, and you know that it was almost an elitist thing. That is not the case. Certainly, in, uh, some of my uh, children's friends have gone to Newbridge, and you get a very good insight into what that school is doing. Um, just a, a couple of questions, I suppose. I mean. Things have changed to some degree. I went to um, a convent primary school, and there were girls there, but we never saw them because there was a divider down the middle of the, the, the classroom. I then went to a single-sex um, primary school and then a single-sex grammar schools. Now, the primary schools has changed now. It's, 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 it's mixed and all of that. But um, I suppose the, one of the questions is, who, who or where do you find the most opposition coming from? Because... If you look at um, the Good Friday Agreement, which obviously we, we would very much want to have all the aspects of the Good Friday Agreement implemented, and surely the best way to promote reconciliation is integrated education. I mean, that's a no-brainer, I think, if you'll excuse the pun. The other thing is, uh, it's good to see that the lack of lagging college, and, and you have a very, very good reputation, is um, all ability school. So the other question I would ask is, um, in terms of the um, entrance tests, uh, do children have to go through the five tests? The reason I ask that, I did the 11 plus a long, long time ago, and we were told we were the last year. So because we were supposed to be the last year, we had um, the same teacher for four years, from uh, seven to 11. It was the same Christian brother. There was 43 in the class, and 43 passed their 11 plus, some through academic ability, quite a lot through fear and, and, and other, um, you know, th things like that. But, I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering, because there's, and, and there's a lot of very good all-ability schools within my own constituency, like you have Katie High School, you have St Paul's and, and St Joseph's and Cross Midland, all, 
all ability schools. I was at one of the prize givens recently, and the kids that are doing so well at every level is, is, is great to see. But I think integration or integrated education is even a step further where that could be. And again, coming from Uri, which has never really suffered the kind of sectarian issues that other places in the north has, has experienced, you can see that reconciliation and integrated education have such an important part to play. So again, congratulations on the work you do. And Newbridge particularly, as I said, unlike some of the colleagues here, I'm very much aware of what it does. Those group of questions? Please. So in relation maybe to, to where the most opposition mm -hmm. comes from, I suppose in, in many senses, if we looked at it very simply, where um, the controlled and maintained schools, and I said it's well established how, how we came to, to be here. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a deliberate attempt to separate children or anything like that, but we are where we are, and as Sam said, the statistics tell us that in general, Protestant and Catholic children are not being educated together. Never mind the other diversity uh, that and, and you, you know that now exists all over Ireland, but in Northern Ireland as well. So, in in a sense, we need to look at it as a as a as a change management kind of program. So, if, like you say. Mickey, you know, you, you went to a certain school. There's a traditional, and, and, and it, schools are very, there's an emotional attachment there. So suppose what we're trying to ask people to do is to think differently about it. You know, I will say to um, Catholic maintained schools and to control schools as well, you know, how are you going to attract people from the minority tradition into your schools? That's, that's all we're asking you to think about. And that's very difficult if that's not the traditional choice that parents make. So in a sense, we're asking parents to make different choices or to empower parents to make a choice to have the school that they are emotionally attached to, that they went to, that their children go to, that their parents went to, to say, is this now time and opportunity for us to as parents, because they have the power to say, we would like our school to transform to integrated status. Now, it is a legal process, and it does take a few years, but the intention <coughs> is there, and that's what we're asking people to do. So in a sense, Mickey, anything that anybody can do to help us to empower parents to make that choice and to change their school, we would be very grateful. In this state, anyway, you know that we're starting to, you know, give that parents that, those choices. You know, sorry, go on. just picking up on a few things that you said, Mickey. There, I'll talk about maybe the limiters of progressing integrated education. I mean, uh, it has been uh, lovely to see parents wanting to send their children to Lagan uh, College over the last number of years. I've been principal for ten years. So that's a great blessing when parents um, are interested in your school and it's very affirming in the work that we do. But the frustration is those, to, those children, those families that we have to turn away because we physically could not accommodate more children on our site up in uh, South Belfast. Um, <coughs> and I suppose as Roshan had said, if the decision makers are those in the CCMS and the uh, Education Authority, it is their decision as to you know, what happens with the funding in terms of opening new schools or supporting new schools. Um, we started grassroots by parents, and we're at a point now where our governors are considering, should we just do that again? That's literally where we're at at the moment as a school, uh, because it is heartbreaking turning children away. Uh, and yet the news uh, papers would tell you that there isn't a demand, but yet we see it every year. So that's one, one thing I would mention. The other thing is the all ability nature of the school. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we welcome children of all different backgrounds, uh, and that cuts across right through to their, their all ability status. Uh, you may know yourself that in the north of Ireland, uh, really uh, since the 60s, there has been a grammar secondary uh, aspect and, and segregation of children in, in effect uh, along those lines. And integrated schools, most integrated schools are certainly all ability and use a non-selective model. Well, I got in college in the 90s before my time as principal uh, because of it being in Bel the Belfast area, which is a very different type of area in terms of parental choice 
uh, in situation, um, decided to go down the bilateral route, which indeed many of our uh, friends in CCMS are doing now with opening new schools as well. So we have children of all different abilities coming to Ligon, but we would uh, take children, 35% of our intake would be of those children who their parents have put them through the AQE or the GL assessment. It's something that our Board of Governors consider every year, and it's something that we, we ask the, the leaders in, in politics when they come back to sit in uh, Stormont to take a, a, a look at as a whole of the Northern Ireland uh, concept rather than just school by school. If I may respond uh, also, thank, thank you for, for that acknowledgement of, uh, of on recognising the work that Newbridge has, has done over the past 20 years. Um, I certainly remember as when I went to Newbridge that it was, it was very obvious to me in the small rural village that I went to uh, attended primary school in that every other child in that in my class in that school was put on a bus and went to another secondary school that was a very deliberate decision by the parents of those children and I don't think the Im implication of that really you know hit, struck me until I was an adult and looked back at that a rural village a lot of farming families uh, a mixed village ostensibly and yet, a lot of parents decided that they were not going to send their children to the school that was 10 minutes walk up the street. That was very powerful. When I attended Newbridge, I was amazed to attend alongside so many other pupils who were the opposite. They were on buses and had come from Balna Hinch, from Lisburn, from Newry, from Mayo Bridge. And they would get maybe two buses, sometimes three buses a day. Um, and I met, I made friends from, with quite a, a range of people from, and my parents hated it. I had to be put in the car and driven to visit all of them and they lived all over the place. And they thought, could you not have made friends with anybody who lived a bit closer to home? <laughs> but they, they didn't hate it at all. It was, it was just exactly what that school allowed me to do, to make friends from lots of different, with lots of different people from many different backgrounds. The opposition that my parents had was striking. There, there, were, there were people, uh, families um, who went to the same primary school, neighbours who were critical of, the, of what they saw, a, a wrong decision. Um, and there's a lot of fear in, in those small communities and it takes a very long time for that fear to dissipate. Uh, there are people who haven't spoken to my parents since and I don't think that you should take for granted the decisions that parents and families and children have made to attend integrated schools. Mm -hmm. They quite often are the first in their family to do so. There are maybe other family members who do not agree with that decision and, and really would oppose it. So opposition to integrated education can lie very close to home. Mm -hmm. The all, uh, all ability uh, aspect of my education Again, I did not really realise until I had left and looked back at my time how, what, a, what a brilliant experience that was for me. Um, I, um, I ha was, certainly as a student, uh, very academically able and I didn't want to go to the grammar school that I had a, a place secured at. I adored the, the feeling the, the day that I walked through the, the gates of Newbridge that I got from every pupil who was there at the open day from every teacher who welcomed me. Um, and that, that it, it, you know, is, is a great reason why over 20 years later I continue to talk about my school education. There aren't very many adults who do that. Sounds very liberating. Morning. Thank you very much. Excuse me. And first to acknowledge the work that you have been doing, and that's this very powerful um, insight that you have given to your own and your own personal experience. Um, I believe in the principle of you know integration, but as uh, Brendan has said, the eight percent is very low, and I think you've outlined some of the obstacles to increasing that number. But are there any other practical steps that can happen? to increase that and I know you talked about it coming from parents and then they have to go through all this process but um, you know in 20 30 years 8% is still low you know is the, are you not getting the message out on the value of integrated education so that brings me to the next question is if you're not getting schools integrated are there any programs that are going on say between schools 
that would increase their awareness of each other and the other the issues in each other's schools. So while they mightn't be on the same campus, but at least there is some engagement between them. Um, and the other one then is, is that as the Republic is becoming more multicultural, is that also another challenge that you're facing as integrated schools, that you're not just talking about the traditional two communities in the north, you're talking about much wider communities, and they, they fit into that. Um, I was interested in the Irish language question, but that, that's been answered um, there. Um, the third one then is about the teacher training. Is that principle of integrated education is a part of the general teacher training, or are you talking about a module or that, that's additional, that's um, not compulsory? I mean, it, it would appear that it should be compulsory as part of, of teacher training. Thank you. Perhaps <coughs> maybe I could respond to the 8%. Um, mm -hmm. um, as Amanda pointed out, uh, many integrated schools are oversubscribed. And parents, if they can't get their child into an integrated school, there isn't another option for them. So they have to go to uh, another management type. Uh, equally, there are only 65 integrated schools, um, which, which reduces the opportunity for parents to send their kids to integrated schools. And the fact that it is just under 8% is actually remarkable in the fact that the government has never planned an integrated school, and as we, I think as we, we said earlier on, all schools have been established by parents, uh, whether they be GMI schools or whether they be transformed schools. It is parent-led. I think it is, it's, it's perhaps um, a challenge to be asking parents to remodel our education system in the North. I think that is a job for our politicians um, and, and officials within uh, the department. Um, I think that is the challenge that we have as a movement, is to try and, and not just grow integrated education in, in, in response to parental <coughs> demand. We need our education system uh, redesigned. Um, we have, again, just maybe repeat myself, but over 50,000 empty school desks. Um, we have a huge tale of underachievement in our schools. All our schools are um, having budget crisis. Uh, next year, it's predicted there will be around 300 million pounds of a shortfall for schools. Most schools are, uh, well, not most schools, many schools are in deficit. Um, we just need the political leadership and the political will to actually make integrated education uh, the norm rather than uh, a, a lifestyle choice for parents to create for themselves. I hope that maybe gives a little bit of context to the 8%. And can I, can I just follow up that, if, you may, if I may, Chair? When you talk about the officials, are you finding a resistance from officialdom to the principle of integrated schools? I, I, I think what we need is uh, the political leadership to advise and instruct the officials to deliver on their statutory duty. Um, I still think that there is, uh, a, there is a need for a better informed uh, officialdom mm -hmm. around integrated education. And one of the <clears throat> barriers, I suppose, there for us is that Although the Department of Education certainly and the Education Authority, um, the Department of Education's duty to encourage and facilitate and to be assisted by the Education Authority to do that, there's a vital word missing there and that's to promote. And so they hand that over to us. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone thinks that, you know, just over half a million pounds and a few members of staff is going to suddenly change hundreds of years of cultural <coughs> uh, traditional choices, then I think that needs to be thought about uh, again in terms of what resourcing. And that's why we have the Integrated Education Fund who raise and income generate and raise funds to try to, I suppose, um, catapult or, or kick off uh, uh, integrated development in certain areas. So, you know, in many senses, that's not good enough. Um, but in terms of what other projects you were talking about, uh, Maureen, 
that are going on there. Over the last 10 years, uh, uh, shared education has developed, and really we're talking about collaboration between schools and also uh, to try and promote peace and reconciliation between schools, between the children and the adults within school communities. And it's a good thing, and it's developed at a, a very rapid pace. I think it's the first kind of cross-party uh, supported uh, peace and reconciliation project that we've had in a very long time, but it will never replace integrated education. Integrated schools are a, a, they're a, a school type, and it's very important that we understand that integrated education and the development of such within a shared education context will hopefully be a bit easier because schools are you know, building up relationships. When I was young, growing up in a small town in County Down, we used to peer over the wall on a Sunday evening to have a look at the Protestant school. And that, that uh, coming, coming and going between schools didn't happen. It is happening now in Northern Ireland, and that's to be commended. But it, you know, our model of all day, every day, learning and playing and working together surely is the way, and we would suggest, a way that our society, uh, like Hillary, has experienced will learn to actually live together um, and not in these separate silos. So that is helping. But you also mentioned the broader diversity in a, in a school. So for example, I will say we are the Council for Integrated Education. We're not the Council for Diversity within Education. Every single school in Northern Ireland has a responsibility to be a diverse school and ensure inclusion of all manner of uh, children from, you know, with different abilities and disabilities and different family backgrounds and different communities and different races and different cultures and, and, and so on. But we are very specific and we are saying we are here to promote peace and <coughs> reconciliation through integrated education. We do definitely believe that we are the biggest, most sustainable, most cost effective community relations project in Northern Ireland for very little money we are actually changing hearts and minds at a rapid pace. So we have a very specific mission, and that is about ensuring that the two main communities, plus everybody else, are educated together. And the possibility of children being educated together, that's what we collectively stand for. From a practitioner's point of view, Maureen, obviously it's school welcoming all children irrespective of, of their background, irrespective of their learning ability, irrespective of whether they've come as a newcomer status from a different country. That is what teachers' vocation is about, to support children to learn, to be happy, to have fun in their early years. Um, at Lagan, we have a number of children who come through newcomer status into the country uh, and we support their needs as we would any other child who had a need, be that special needs or a child who had a gift and talent into something. It is all of our jobs to try to encourage that child to pursue what they enjoy and, and to be better at it. Um, you mentioned, I'll take it back a wee bit, you did mention, um, you know, why the growth. As a leader in education, I hear a lot of our politicians talking about equality, talking about respect, but maybe there needs to be t more talk about shared housing and shared education. And um, in the widest sense, shared education, we absolutely <coughs> uh, are passionate about shared education. Uh, it is an important vehicle for children to get a chance to meet one another. Um, I had the opportunity of going to uh, uh, a meeting with children who were uh, coming into the education profession through a PGCE placement, and I asked some of those children if they had ever met somebody of a different religion or were they their friends? And it still shocked me to find young men and women uh, not too far from Hillary's age who'd never met somebody of one of the major tra traditions in Northern Ireland. That was quite a shocking uh, revelation to me. So I think it's in all of our interest to do our best um, uh, to enable any child, if they wish to come to an integrated school, to come and for us to meet their, in their learning needs. I have been asked recently to speak uh, in front of St Mary's and uh, Stranmillis students who will be eventually the teachers of the future, uh, which was, uh, it's been very rewarding to be invited to speak to them next Tuesday. This is the second time I'll be speaking to them on grounds of what integrated education is and what inclusive practice is. So it is happening. Um, there is a joint module 
being done between teachers in St Mary's and Stromulus, so it's very encouraging. It's certainly the first step in the right direction, I would say. But just to maybe to add to that too, uh, for all sorts of reasons, teachers end up teaching in integrated schools and classroom assistants end up being in integrated schools, but there is no dedicated induction program or training and development within you know being a teacher in an integrated school and it's something we think a lot about and we would you know we're, we're hoping to go back to the for department of foreign affairs very soon to say you know like a bigger strategy around because every one of our teachers and every school is struggling with the same kind of issues, a bit like you had picked up, Mickey, you know, and how do we prepare these teachers and how do we share that learning across the educational system in general? Um, now, there might be some of that being able to done, be able uh, to be facilitated through shared education, but we feel it's so important that it needs to be at the, at the heart of any teacher institution that is the, developing the teachers of the future. Can I let Niall in now? Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much for the presentation so far. Um, it's been really informative and really useful. Um, I just want to commend you to you on the nomination. That's quite uh, the achievement, um, and I'm every confidence in you going forward. Um, I just want to reflect to you on the fact that I had a brilliant visit to Lagan College when I was Lord Mayor of Belfast. Um, I went to Malone and a few others as well, and it was a great. Uh, you, you, you know, as soon as you walk into a school, if it's a happy school and if it's a healthy school and if people are doing well and certainly picked up on that. So it might be worth, not that I would ever presume to tell you what to do, but it might be worth before you go even extend an invitation to the committee to come out and see that uh, for themselves uh, in practice. Um, Chair, I have a couple of wee questions just in, in terms of the uh, some of the issues that have been re raised already, maybe to uh, expand uh, on them. I'm keen to know what the difference is between an integrated school and a non-denominational school or a multi-denominational school um, is, what, what that, how that actually plays out in practice. Um, because in many ways, of course, you want all schools to be integrated, but in the reality of our life, is it going to be possible? Because you know there, there are obviously different right to choice there and, and everything else. Um, the, I was really impressed uh, and really pleased to hear uh, about the work undertaken by Lagan because I have uh, an interest in, in the Irish language uh, around the availability up to A level um, uh, of Irish and also the uh, team for a play to them winning the McCrory uh, Cup last year. I'm just curious to know is that replicated across the sector or is that unique to Lagan or unique to Belfast or unique to particular um, geographical uh, areas going forward? And I just wanted, if you could, just to tell me a wee bit about Integration Works uh, as a project um, and, and uh, the importance of the support from the department uh, in relation to that and the other projects mentioned. Is that fair enough? Yes. Um, maybe uh, your question, Niall, around what's the difference between integrated, um, I presume you meant Catholic maintained, non-denominational, multi-denominational, yeah. Yeah, you know, faith, so, uh, faith as opposed to yes. So, like for example, I'm, I'm not, the last thing I want to do is pit sectors against sectors here, right? But I'm just talking in a frank way because it's important that a committee like this talks like that. So, for example, I went through non-denominational education. Um, the religious sacraments were available to people if they cho chose them. They weren't to others who didn't want them. There was people there from. Uh, Jewish backgrounds, Protestant backgrounds, but the unifier there was it was delivered through the medium of Irish. Um, so I don't know, was I at an integrated school all along and didn't know it, or was I at a non So it's just about, because if, if we're going to advocate for a model universally, we just have to be careful that it's not at the expense or, or the detriment of another. And really what I would like is to give you the opportunity to reassure and you know Jim Gibney who works in my office with me always says light a candle as opposed to curse the dark so just to maybe light a wee candle on that to, re to reassure that, that that isn't the case at all. Just for an audience anyone listening at home like, even the you know the language control school you know 
you know, it's, you know, it's an image, but you know, again, that's that's the you know that's the description, mm -hmm. but it's not you know how you would describe a school in yeah. the south, you know. So, so uh, maybe I'll just kick off on this one. Um, so you have Catholic maintained schools and you have controlled schools, and because most Catholic parents would choose Catholic education by default, even though the Protestant churches transferred their schools over in 1947, by default you have in the majority yeah. uh, controlled schools are those from a, a perceived Protestant background. Of course there are, there's a diversity in all of those schools as well, but in general Catholic parents don't choose controlled school education. There are the anomalies obviously. And so that's kind of w where we are in terms of that. What integrated schools do is that they deliberately and proactively and intentionally strive for a balance between Catholics, Protestants and others within their schools. Now, some people say, oh, why do you need that? Well, why did we need it for the PSNI? Or why do sometimes we need to do these things in order to make sure that actually people have a voice? And research would show that once you go below 10%, that sometimes people get very quiet and don't feel that they have a voice. So we deliberately try to create schools that are uh, equal in terms of the uh, pupil population or balance in, in pupil population, but also in the Board of Governors. And this is an important distinction to make. So within Catholic maintained schools, there are a number of Catholic trustees on every school board. And in control schools, you would have transfers, which were from the three main churches, uh, the Presbyterian, the Methodist and the uh, Church of Ireland. And so in every control school of nine governors, for example, almost half of those, so four out of the nine, will be from the transferers, so from the main Protestant churches. So as you know, uh, governors set the culture and set the strategic direction of the school, if you like, but they also create the, you know, what happens within the school. And we would suggest an integrated schools, that's what makes them different, is that they will strive to have a balance within their board of governors so that, so that all of the children will see their culture and their tradition reflected in both the governing body, but also in the staffing population. Does that yep. answer your question, Niall? Yep, no, no, it does, surely. I, I think, think perhaps maybe also to add to that, um, in terms of what actually happens within an integrated school, uh, I think Amanda alluded to it earlier on, it's about addressing diversity and celebrating diversity within the school. And there's an opportunity to do that um, because of the diversity within the school. Um, that doesn't happen within um, a single tradition school. As I pointed out, you know, only less than 8% of Protestants, or, or sorry, 8% of Catholics go to Protestant uh, controlled schools, and only less than 1% of Protestants go to a Catholic school. Um, and there just is, in essence, there is only one narrative um, being heard within those schools. Uh, whereas within an integrated school, there is multi-narratives happening, not just in the playground, but also in the staff room and within the classroom as well. Um, can I pick up, Niall? Um, my sister-in-law uh, is an Irish medium uh, primary school teacher in Stravan. Uh, a few years ago, she set up that school. Um, it's very close to my heart, what happens in that wee school. Um, and there's a lot of brilliant, inclusive practice going on absolutely brilliant inclusive practice on a number of lines has been mentioned today the edge in terms of where we take integrated education is, is as Roshin said it's across all different strands mm. so it sounds as if you had a very inclusive mm. uh, experience which would not be too far away from taking that move forward into being an integrated school had there been maybe children of other uh, faith or backgrounds coming to your school I'm sure you would have had children from different ethnicities different cultures, etc., but maybe not of the other main denomination in, in Northern Ireland? No, no, not, not really. And, that's, and, and it would be, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and it's a really yeah. interesting discussion. Um, and actually, I want to come on to what Hillary said, because a lot of what Hillary said in her opening presentation 
rang true with me too in terms of my own experience. Um, I, I was educated, uh, educated upstairs, upstairs at the Culter Land before it was refurbished into the beautiful facility it is now, um, and we were really up against it uh, in terms of our experience too. So that, that was a great unifier too. That's a great way to instill uh, a positive ethos and unifying spirit um, within any school, regardless uh, of their experience. So I'm keen to talk to Hilary about how I, I get tips from her to establish a similar body for those of us who have passed through uh, mm -hmm. Irish medium education to become champions and advocates for that too, because uh, aside from everything else and really park everything at a, in a climate where a lot of young people going through that sector are feeling abused and feeling vilified and feeling mm -hmm. removed from because of a lot of the, 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 the public statements that have been made and things over the past uh, wee way, I think that would be um, very useful. But look, no, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, 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 the presentation today. I appreciate uh, what you're doing, um, and I, I do think there would be maybe merit sure, um, in uh, w whatever slot available to us, whether it's, I don't, I don't know, to maybe take a race out and get a look at um, what's happening um, in Langan too. Oh, and just that wee question about the issue of the, and it mightn't be practical, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot here, um, but in terms of the availability of um, RAs as A level or the, the sports that would be available in Langan, is that available across the sector? geographically yeah. or is that confined to certain areas? Well, I better put a plug in for Drumrara Integrated College because they won the O'Reilly Cup a few years before us and I had the lovely opportunity of working in Drumrara in 1998. Uh, it was a difficult time for that community as well but mm. um, I suppose I mean now you come from a background of, of, of enjoyment of politics mm. and what I love as a principal of an integrated school is seeing our young people coming from all different angles of politics mm and having the ability to debate and to be, to be able to debate without fear or judgment that you can hold a very different opinion. And no more so than in recent uh, years have we seen a lot of other factors coming in where our young people want to talk about these mm. things, want to have, they may have differences of opinion on, on Brexit, no Brexit, you know, what's going to happen in Ireland, Northern Ireland, the North of Ireland. Mm. And we should be encouraging those young people not to be afraid to talk it through. Because if you don't talk it through and you don't communicate with one another, then we'll take a step back to what we had before, which is people being fearful of one another and not really understanding what happens in each of our homes, in each of our school and our communities as well. Yeah, well, I'd finish on this, Chair. I, yes, and I absolutely agree with that. I commend that statement and, and would commend it to every single school, no matter where they are. We had an interesting discussion earlier in the Shannon, um, myself and Senator Crockwell, although he wasn't in the room for my bit, he left, um, about just in the climate we're in. I, I am of a school of thought that regardless of where it is or what it's about, the more you uh, empower young people mm -hmm. to be engaged in politics, mm -hmm. to be engaged in critical thought and, and, and activism, the better. Um, so any school ethos that, that doesn't push that but certainly promotes and enables it, um, I think is very, very positive mm -hmm. and very commendable and worth so. um, supporting. Sorry, you are, Jerry. Now is the so time for you, <laughs> Jerry, to come back. Thanks for me to pop in here. Um, first and foremost, I'm sorry I wasn't here for your presentation. I was engaged in something else. But um, believe it or not, I grew up in a segregated society in Salt Hill in Galway. Right? Boys swam in different places than girls. Girls did not go to the same school as boys. So it was a different sort of segregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm delighted to inform my colleague, Senator O'Donnell, that in 1967, young people found their voice and came forward. And we did have, for the first time ever, integrated swimming in Salt Hill, which was something <laughs> to behold, I can tell you. Right? And I was fully behind this. <laughs> As I am behind, I spent 25 years of my life uh, teaching, and I'm all for young people having a voice. I'm totally against exploiting young people in order for adults to have their voice heard. But that's another story, and myself and Neil can argue that one out uh, well into the future. Look, I, I think what you're trying to do, and what the, 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 uh, the shared education system is good as a second-class alternative. Integration is the only way forward, in my view. Uh, but having spent 25 years in education, I can tell you that education change comes slowly, mm -hmm. very slowly. Mm -hmm. And um, 
even simple things like changing a teacher midway through a course. You can have a very poor teacher teach a subject and bring in an absolutely excellent teacher halfway through a course, and students will complain, you know, because we are used to certain systems. So going back to 1967 and the introduction of girls into the technical school, and I must compliment the vocational education system in Ireland, which abandoned religion and uh, concentrated on its core ethos, which was education. Um, it changed the lives of many of us who, who grew up. Uh, we actually saw, I believe, and I would hope that I carried it through my life, we actually saw girls as fellow human beings, not as some strange object that were over that wall you were talking about, Miss Marshall, where we did sneak up and look over the wall because we wanted to see what was going on in there. There must be something going on in there, right? <laughs> so um, I, I think what you're about is really important. Now, two weeks ago, I was up in, in Northern Ireland, and I had a, a long discussion with some people from the unionist tradition. And one of the things they were applauding was the level of increased mixed marriages that were taking place in the North of Ireland. And I believe that that will impact your um, provision as time goes on. My concern, and every time somebody comes from Northern Ireland, I regret to say the B word has to be used. So my concern is funding, because if you're to be successful, and if you're really to be successful, two things will matter as you go forward. The first is results. Parents will abandon all beliefs if there are results in the school. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where the school is. I'm mindful of one school here in Dublin, and I'm not going to say where it is. It had the most appalling first year to sixth year students. I mean, you literally had to go in there wearing a flak jacket and gas mask to survive a class, right? But it had one repeat leaving cert class and parents from the richest parts of Dublin sent their children there because they were guaranteed results. Right? So results is the lifeblood of the school. There is no doubt at all about that. And opening up opportunity, and I, I, I think given that you have the imagination to be involved in integrated education, I believe that you will also be um, uh, open to alternatives to third level. We're pushing too many mm -hmm. children to third level. So I would assume that your uh, interest is in apprenticeship and parity of esteem across the different uh, vocational versus academic routes that one can take. So with the onset of Brexit, and good God, we have no idea what's going to happen there over the next few days, weeks, months, or whatever. My concern is that if we do have a break uh, between uh, the UK and Europe, my concern is that the funding that may have been available, and I'm not sure how much of your funding would come through the peace uh, process system, not much. Well, then maybe you don't have too much to fear, but funding is, for me, a really important thing. I, other than that, I, I mean, results, having people like uh, my, my colleague uh, Mickey Brady here, having people like Noel O'Donnell. I'm always concerned about politicians in the South talking about what's going on in the North, because uh, in truth, so few people from the South travel up and actually experience the North, right? It's a wonderful place, beautiful country, so it is, and I love the people up there. I also love getting my car fixed up there two weeks ago because it was cheaper than down here, but that's another day's work. But, <laughs> OK, no, that's it, results and funding. So, I mean, without the funding, you're not able to uh, employ the staff that will give you the results, and I'd just be interested in your view on that. Thank you. Yes, so certainly, yes, very good points, and we would uh, certainly concur with, with you, know, you know, every school has to be a good school. That's first and foremost. You've got to be a good school, uh, and, then, and then parents uh, will, will buy into your ethos and so on as well. But the funding is, is something that we are very concerned about also. I mean, obviously, very, very grateful for the 300 million odd allocated uh, to integrated schools for their capital buildings, um, without which some of those schools would have not survived much longer because they were built as core plus mobiles. So you had a main block and then just mobile uh, classrooms with a lifespan of 15 to 20 years, most of which have surpassed that time now. So very, very grateful to that. But with that also comes the revenue. So as our schools grow, 
the numbers of children attending integrated schools since the Good Friday Agreement have doubled. It's not a story a lot of people know because they talk about the growth of school buildings, uh, but actually the growth of the numbers ha have doubled. And with that comes the revenue needed for teaching staff, for uh, growth within uh, the school buildings and so on as the school grows. And that revenue is not there to back up the capital funding. And we're very concerned about that, particularly now as five uh, development proposals for nursery units. So the lifeblood, every child, the best start in life, not having the opportunity for an integrated setting from age three um, really concerns us because the reason given was lack of funding. And that's the first time in our history that we have ever heard that. A, we had to raise our own money through the IEF or through ourselves uh, going and borrowing money from the club bank. We had to do all of that. But eventually, when we proved the viability of the school, the Department of Education would vest it. And I believe a lot of the money would have come through Europe at that time. But so our concern is exactly that. How are we going to? Because to me, integrated education would grow exponentially if it was financially uh, incentivised. And there is no doubt in my mind that that would happen. But, you know, 43 million going into shared education, albeit fantastic, none of that money came to integrated education. Went to integrated schools involved in shared education, but not to integrated education. So I think, you know, anything we can do in terms of changing that situation is going to be vital for the growth of integrated education. Because I think that's so important. Um, the difficulty. So I'm, I'm going to finish up, Charlie. So it was just it was just in terms of funding because I spent eight years in the assembly, um, and eight of those years were spent on the health committee. And 43 percent of the overall budget the executive went in health. The other 57 was in education infrastructure. And all there's simply not enough money. Part of the problem, if not the problem, is Tory austerity. They took approximately 1.2 billion off the executive budget in the eight years I was there, and that hasn't been replaced. So, because we don't have fiscal levers in the north, even if the assembly is up and running, and it should be, because obviously local people would make local decisions better decisions, and the, that, that therein lies the problem. So that's something that needs to be addressed as well, because we get a cake and you slice it up as best you can, and that's right across the educational sector. And for the position that you're in is even worse in a sense, because you don't get the funding that you should be getting anyhow. So therein lies the problem. Brexit um, is going to be a disaster for everybody. I mean, I go to Westminster, I was over this week uh, and I was over the week before. Um, it, it's, nobody knows. Nobody has a clue what's happening, including the people that are supposed to make the decision. But funding for yourselves is an even bigger problem in many ways because you are relying on parents and fundraising, and that's why you have the organisation you have, yeah. which is to be commended, because you're very much on your own in that sense. And I think uh, the other thing, too, about the promotion, the two governments have a responsibility to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement is implemented. And a big part of that, as I said before, is a promotion of integrated education. Thank you. Okay, so, do you just want to sum up? Yeah. Are you just happy? Can I just, well, I, I, I want to pick up on your point, Jared, as we finish today. Um, it is about, schools are essentially about helping children to learn about themselves, about others, and about their future career paths and their future prospects. And I think that, as been mentioned, you know, every school wishes to be a good school. Um, the joy of working in integrated schools, because we have children of all abilities, they will go into the workplace, be that through university, uh, um, as Hilary has, and then on to the career path, or through apprenticeships, through gap years, uh, through charity organisations, and that's an absolute joy to see that from that 11 to 18 years of age, you can really make a difference to them. Uh, but I definitely do believe, as a principal, but also as a mother of a child who attends an integrated school, that um, integrated education is doing much more than that. It is our civil duty to try and encourage children to make sure that we don't make the mistakes of the past by integrating them into understanding what peace looks and feels like. So we, none of us know what Brexit will feel like, 
But as a principal of a school, I have to be optimistic that the children will go forward and hopefully make a difference in the world. Could I um, interject and say that one thing I would like to, the, the committee to take away is how much learning takes place from students among students. Um, I learned a great deal from my peers at Newbridge. When I uh, started secondary school, I had never seen a GAA jersey before. Um, and I made friends. <laughs> and uh, I made friends with, with a, a, a girl in my class from Mayo Bridge who was a Kerry supporter. Now, I don't want to get into too much about Kerry today. <laughs> yeah. But, um, we will advise. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this summer I, I have relocated to Dublin and I have taken up a position as the acting director at the Irish Writer Centre and I have just moved outside Croke Park. I have become a great deal more acquainted with uh, GAA jerseys, but I just would like to, to make clear how that learning from people who can share their own stories with each other and say, what's that? and explain it to somebody who is on your level in a way that is without fear and without judgment, maybe a bit of judgment. I mean, kids are very good at rubbing each other. I mean, I, I learned more there about cultural differences than I could be taught formally. And now, uh, as, as chair of the Integrated Alumni, I have the privilege of working with adults who feel this is so important to them that they want to give up their time and energy to continue to talk about it. Um, as Senator uh, across the way mentioned, uh, it is very difficult, as you know, to manage a committee. Everyone has different opinions. Everybody's coming from different positions. And what better training is there as adults to deal with difficult political issues than adults who were taught at a, and formed as adults to share their experiences, to discuss differences, and learn how to do that in a, a, a grown-up fashion, actually, which I would love to see reflected in our political leadership. Okay. And just one thing, Niall had asked about the integration works uh, process and how that works, uh, and we can we can certainly uh, send more information about that. But really, that is around parental engagement, uh, community engagement. Uh, trying to uh, educate people about what integrated education is and about the uh, empowerment, as I said before, for parents to transform whatever school their current management type is to integrate it. And you can either be a grant maintained integrated, which it means the Board of Governors are its managing authority, or a controlled integrated, which means that the Education Authority are the managing authority. And the good news is that this transformation is open to every single school, apart from special schools and hospital schools. So any school can transform to integrated status. And my question would be out there to people, if you're a school with a bit of a mix of Protestants and Catholics at the minute, why would you not transform? How many controlled schools have transformed? 27. Good. It's good. But I think as we go forward, that will increase. It's already increased in the last couple of years. We now have six schools going through the process and maybe another five coming down the tracks. So I think it's going to gain <coughs> momentum and our invitation to all schools uh, out there who, you know, you're, you're a great school, you're serving your communities, you're, you're doing everything really well. And on top of that, you can be an integrated school, which means that you're openly declaring to your wider community circle that we are a place that wants to promote reconciliation and peace in Northern Ireland. Okay, maybe that's a positive note. I, Sam, I you want one more word? Okay. the best uh, way to conclude today, uh, with the exception of just saying, once again, thank you so much to the committee for giving us the opportunity to come down here and talk about what we are passionate about, and that is integrated education. And just to pick up on, on now, uh, we would like to extend an invitation for the committee to come and visit an integrated school. And as yes, you right. don't need to the hurdle now to, the, to, the, to decide this or anything now. Oh, no, no, you're very welcome. I think Niall lives not a stone's throw from us anyway. So 
He can, yeah, he can maybe lagging. put you up overnight. He can yeah. do yeah. B&B for you. Yeah. <laughs> and it might be good. Lagging uh, for many years spent their life in mobile classrooms, uh, like uh, many of the integrated schools where they started from. And But they've got a shiny new building now, which is absolutely beautiful. But I'd also like to extend the invitation to maybe as well come and visit one of our schools who are really struggling with their Idiot. building. Yep. It's always, good. it's always positive, yeah. So, again, on behalf of the Joint Committee, really thank you, thank you for your, uh, your positive, um, refreshing uh, presentation here today. Really wish you well with the Nobel uh, nomination. And uh, maybe when you get the nomination, you might come back and visit us then as well. <laughs> but we will take you up on the, the, your kind invitation and hopefully and uh, meet up in the future. So again, on behalf of the committee, thanks very much. Thank you. Many thanks. Okay. Thank you. So we'll now go into private session. Is that agreed?